Welcome to Spaces Between. I'm your host, Roy Kennedy, and with me today is Michael Coe. What's going on, man? Hey, hey, how you doing? Doing pretty good. So if anybody doesn't know, Michael is the the I guess the CEO of Gamelin Games, who produces all of the tiny epic games, a huge successes on Kickstarter, and also has a game called Heroes of Land, Air and Sea, which I am quite fond of as well. But uh, yeah, Michael, how's it going? Oh, it's going great. Just uh, actually today we spent a lot of time uh, playtesting some of our new titles. So today was kind of a fun day where we just went through all the games that we have in development pretty much and, and just went through each one of them. So it was pretty cool. Um, but yeah, things are going really well. Got some fun things planned. That's awesome. How how early in like advance do you guys start planning out for these Kickstarters? Because I'm sure they're like a huge deal for you guys. Uh, well, in terms of like Kickstarters, we usually know sometime during the year we'll know exactly what we're going to be doing next year. Mm-hmm. Um, now that you know can fluctuate a little bit, uh, but every year we do a tiny epic retreat where. Um, Scott Alms comes out, Ben Shulman, who does the graphic design for the Tiny Epic Games, come out. Our team, we all get together, we meet up, and we rent a cabin uh, that's up north here in Arizona. Mm-hmm. And it's got a nice little lakeside, so we can go canoeing and stuff. And we just have some good, fun activities. But that's where we really kind of flesh out what the you know future is going to look like for gotcha. the Tiny Epic series in particular. Uh, and kind of get that all mapped out. That That's awesome. So you'll basically and, plan out the next year on your retreat yeah. there. Yeah, it's, that, pre- it's pretty effective. That sounds super fun. Um, And you guys, oh my goodness, how many Tiny Epic games are there now? Uh, Well, so there's 10 core titles and two uh, or three of them have expansions, so 13. But one Quest core title expansion. Is, Where's my Tiny Quest Epic expansion Man, at? No, I'm just kidding. So... <laughs> Yeah, over on the we Dice have, Tower, we've we been doing. Ideas. We've been we doing our. We're doing our sorry. top 100 over on the Dice Tower, and Quest has come up on me and um, Mike Delicio's list, and uh, it's like, oh man, I can't wait for there to be more Quest someday, or at least like crossover, utilize some of the other tiny epic items in Quest would be pretty cool too. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, we, we've definitely uh, we've toyed around with some neat ideas for Quest, so. It's it's in the works somewhere. <laughs> Can't say when, but it's happening. Nice. And I know um, as of when this releases, mine and Mike Delicio's review for Tiny Epic Tactics is going to be going up the next day. So this is going to be coming out on Monday, and then our review is going to be coming out on Tuesday. So uh, yeah. super excited uh, for that review to go up as well. So we've been yeah. playing around with some excited tactics to... and stuff like that. I'm excited to hear that. Nice. And that that was a game where you guys went back to not using the item meeples. I'm guessing you guys are still going to be using those in the future too, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. We're not done with the item meeples. <laughs> Actually, we've got some pretty neat plans for the item meeples. So, these just but yeah, we've got we've done a couple now uh between tactics and dinosaurs that didn't have the item meeples. Um but we definitely we're not done with them. We love the item meeples. It's our favorite toy to play with. <laughs> So I definitely think the whole philosophy behind Tiny Epic is like super interesting. Like this idea of making these games that feel like something bigger than they are, but then fit in a tiny little box. Like how did that idea come about or like where did Tiny Epic start for you guys? Uh, it started really early um, for Game on Games and it was kind of a, a thing where in the, when, in the beginning when I was um, – publishing titles that I was designing and just trying to, uh, you know, show that I can take a concept, you know, all the way through manufacturing into distribution. Mm-hmm. Um, because it was all falling on my shoulders, I I wanted any mistakes I made to be small mistakes and oh, not yeah. blow up. And so <laughs> I wanted to start with small games because then everything is smaller, right? The manufacturing bill will be smaller, the distribution bill will be smaller and and that way I felt a little bit like I could uh, you know I wasn't overwhelmed if anything went really bad then then it would maybe you know ruin my whole life or something um and so I started with smaller games uh, like Rise and Dungeon Heroes mm-hmm. and I liked that I liked that space um so I was really interested in in continuing to see what could be done in that small space. And at that time, um, you know, back in 2011, 2012, 
uh, small games were pretty much just fillers. There wasn't really any games out there, um, maybe just a couple, but nothing, you know, that was starting like a trend, for instance, of of offering a lot of experience in a small game. Um, and so and then also, of course, there's the added value that when it's in a smaller package that I don't have to ask for too much of a commitment from people who want to try our games and play our mm-hmm. games. Um, and then, of course, it makes it easier for them to be able to take the game around as well. So, but that's what that's kind of where my mind was at and what I was interested in. And then when Scott Alms reached out to me with a, a game design idea at the time called Tiny Epic Planets, um, and I've talked about it before, but that eventually became Tiny Epic Kingdoms. Hmm. Uh, but when I first printed that out and played it, I was like, this is exactly what I'm looking for. This this can, is a small game, but it really packs a lot of punch. It feels mm-hmm. like a full game. Uh, it's very satisfying in that you can develop strategies and pull them off. But you know, definitely not a filler. Uh, and so, and then when when we put it out there on Kickstarter and it did really well, it was well received. Um, I went back to Scott and I'm like, this is I want to do a lot of these. Like whatever this was that we just did, let's keep <laughs> doing this. And uh, hence the Tiny Epic series became a thing. It's crazy because I feel like Tiny Epic is just such a huge brand now for you guys. And it's like people know in the board game industry, Tiny Epic, oh my goodness. And it's it's always interesting to see what you guys are going to do next and how you're going to utilize this, this. It's such a tiny space. I know uh, in my previous podcast we talked before where you're like – measure out each component each weight because you don't want it to go over the weight to be able to ship it out properly and how do you fit all the stuff in the box oh yeah i've been i've been hit with that pretty bad where it was tiny epic defenders so it was the Mm -hmm. second one and i didn't think about the weight um Mm -hmm. as much and and we added a bunch of stretch goals and sure enough that came back and and bit us pretty hard because Mm -hmm. uh we came in overweight and that was tens of thousands of dollars extra in shipping that was just because we were overweight by just a little bit. If I had trimmed out four cards, then we would could have saved 10 plus thousand dollars. That's um, insane. <laughs> but I was committed obviously, you know, and so I, I, I just, I, I took it on the chin and then said, yeah, that's not going to happen again. So now we're going to make sure we weigh everything out and we're very meticulous about it. So it's just learning from, learning from the mistakes, you know, I'm falling. <laughs> Sorry. But tiny yeah, so. epic tiny epic webcam. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh yeah, it's awesome. Um it's definitely interesting how much you guys are able to fit in there and not just like gameplay itself. Like there's a ton of components in these games as well and they take up a a decent amount of table presence sometimes when you put it out there. It's like all of that came out of that little box. <laughs> Yeah, components are a big deal to me. When I first started in the in the board game hobby, I came from the video game world, so I wasn't I didn't grow up playing a lot of board games. Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of my attraction to board games was getting games for their components, and I I was almost as compelled by the components as I was the mechanics. And so I've just I've always had a, a spot in my heart for a game that's got really cool components, and I think that shows through our our, our line. Yeah, yeah. I know uh, Galaxies has been such a huge hit. So many people, like when they say, oh, what's your favorite Tiny Epic game? Everybody's like, Galaxies. Uh, my personal favorite is Quest. I really enjoy like the um, the Hyrulean theme of it almost and the pressure lug aspect of it. But but uh, is is there like a certain one, like as far as numbers is concerned, like that is definitely a clear victor as far as Tiny Epic goes? Uh, no, it's it's pretty interesting. Um, so Tiny Epic Galaxies, uh, it continues to sell very well. Mm-hmm. Um, and but Tiny Epic Zombies had the biggest Kickstarter. Oh wow! And and Tiny Epic Quest, for a little bit, has been outselling Zombies just in the past like quarter, two quarters, and so it, it kind of fluctuates. And mm. um, I would say that Galaxy still continues to be a uh, probably our strongest title, but not by a large margin. And all of the tiny epics still continue to perform. Um, we're still doing uh, reprints for tiny, every year we do reprints for tiny epic kingdoms, uh, defenders, Western, we're coming up on a reprint, right? We're pretty much entering production here in the next couple of weeks for a reprint of Western. That'll be its third printing. So it's, 
they all continue to to do well. I think when people discover a game in the series, whether it's through galaxies because everybody's you know showing it off galaxies to them, or they watch a review or something, um, and then they learn about the series for the first time, and they're like, oh well, this well, this was really awesome what they did here, and there's more, you know, and then they look into it, and so it's it's pretty great. Nice. Is there a um? Would you say like a style of game that you guys have like attempted to be like, oh man, this tiny epic thing, but then it was just like, ah, oh, we can't fit that sort of game in this small of a box. Like, I, I can't even necessarily think of something, but it's like, have you guys ever been like, oh, we got to go back to the drawing board because that's not going to fit in what we want to do here? Um, I guess maybe a deck builder, but yeah, yeah. we've not given up on it. It's just a matter hmm. of figuring out interesting and unique what new approaches um to kind of an old beloved system in a sense not that old but um but cards surprisingly or maybe not if you know about it are the most heavy component in the box mm. heavier than any of the wood or the plastic it's those cards are so dense you know and so having like a deck builder where we want to offer a whole bunch of cards for the variety uh is not all that feasible to stay in our weight restrictions for for the game and so that we're having to to be creative and take other approaches but uh it's a it's a good challenge yeah i i don't know i don't know how people would take to like a like if you release a tiny epic game that was just all cards like regardless of weight i don't <laughs> think it would be the same because i mean it wouldn't have the same table presence you guys always have like little little meeple ships or little meeple guys or little meeple towers or little like i don't know there's something about that that just screams tiny epic to me and if it was just cards would that still be you know the same sort of thing that won't happen not while i'm alive there won't be a tiny (laughs) there'll be all kinds of components shoved in that box (laughs) so it it would be some sort of deck building hybrid with another thing that introduces plenty of good components Nice. I know a lot of your tiny epic games have like a shared world. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how that came about and like the the whole Ogmore thing? Yeah, yeah. Just bear with me while I get a little nerdy and, and it's, <laughs> it's nostalgic to me, but it doesn't mean anything to anyone else. Listen, but... everybody that's here listening is probably has to admit to themselves that they're extremely nerdy too. Come on. <laughs> All right. Fair. Fair enough. Um. So when I was younger, I played uh, quite a bit of Dungeons and Dragons, mm-hmm. and when I started uh, doing the, you know, taking over the role of the dungeon master, I I really enjoyed wasting time in school making my own maps of worlds, and then I would make monsters and make my own storylines, and then I put my friends through those dungeons and that overworld and whatnot. Um, and so I first I drew a map of Ogmore, and I don't know if it's out there online or anywhere, but if I ever put it out there, but um, I drew that back when I was in high school. And I and we, me and my buddies played for pretty much all of our high school years in Ogmore because I was always just the, I was I was just the designated DM DDM, and uh, and so we spent a lot of time in that world and it was a fun place and and one of the NPCs that I had from the major capital city the the biggest you know city you know in the in Ogmore um, was Gamelin. Mm-hmm. And when I kind of transitioned out of playing Dungeons and Dragons and I started playing other games, kind of going back to some computer games like World of Warcraft, I made my character in World of Warcraft named Gamelin. And then nice. when I ended up uh, quitting World of Warcraft and starting Gamelin Games, I kind of just did that as like a tip of the hat to my WoW character, but my, also the NPC for my old games in D&D. And then I just, uh, when we were doing kingdoms and some other ones we needed names for some of the places and i was like well why come up with a whole bunch of new names i'll just go back to my old map that i drew as a as a somebody in high school as a teenager and i just started picking stuff off that map and then eventually it was just like well so much has been gleamed from this map then this is just where we're at i mean this is ogmore you know and and that's just kind of stuck it's just kind of worked that's awesome like i don't know i think there's something cool about the fact because i mean i grew up playing gamma world and all these different role-playing games and i played tons and tons of DD. and it's cool that like not only like the world that you created in your DD game has also like birthed these other games and stuff or like have you used, reused any like the character names because i know there's tons of names and tactics and things like that 
Yeah, so the, the, a lot of the character names um, are are connected in some of the different games. Or they're like, if you get the um, Tiny Epic Defenders, the second edition has mm-hmm. stories about some of the characters, and some of those characters are related uh, to other characters that you may play in, like Heroes of Land, Air, and Sea, or Tiny Epic Tactics, um, or there's just some direct crossover of characters. Uh, the characters that came from my old D&D campaigns would be Gamelin and Lalathar. And then there's a few other characters that I've not brought into uh, any any of our board games yet, um, but those two were big characters back in my D and D campaigns, and they've showed up in obviously Gamelin, but Lalathar is in Tactics and in Heroes of Land, Air, and Sea. That's and then awesome. Lalathar's daughter is in Tiny Epic Defenders Second Edition. It's crazy. I've talked on this podcast several times. It's it's amazing how big D and D has gotten these days. Like I remember when yeah, it's like, oh, yeah. oh, oh, D&D, like it's the thing you you quietly play and like you play it with your small <laughs> group of friends. But D&D has exploded. I mean, there's whole Twitch channels that all they do is play D&D and there's famous voice actors playing stuff and famous actors playing D&D. And it's in TVs and movies now. And I mean, you can go to Target yeah. and buy like a set of polyhedral dice and they have all the D&D essential stuff. And it's just like, what? This is this is crazy. This is awesome. Oh, yeah. Back in the day, it was hard to find a set of polyhedral dice. Like there was maybe you know one or two stores across a few towns, mm-hmm. and you had to go out of your way to go to those stores and find those dice and find the books. You know, it was not easy. Uh, and and yeah, I mean back back in the day when I was playing, my group of friends, we were the people that kind of got the parents concerned because we would put <laughs> on like ambient music, you know, that like changed depending on if you were like on an old forest road or if you got into the town or if you're and in now a dungeon, there's like you know? whole companies that are based around like creating those sound boards that yeah. you can play on your iPad and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh man, there's this awesome, we played a, a game of Ravenloft that where my, mm-hmm. my other friend was the dungeon master for it and he set it up with candles and turned all the lights out and we like played by candlelight with eerie music and I mean, yeah, it's, but it's it's awesome. But, but then it did died you defeat Strahd? Oh, that's the real question. It came back. Nice. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, yeah, D and D is has grown and so crazy. Um, so I, I I'm a really big fan of one of you guys' bigger games. That's not quite tiny. And I know this was kind of like a game that you had been uh, dreaming of making for a while. Can you tell us a little bit how Heroes of Land, Air, and Sea came about? Yeah, so um, it was so Scott and I actually discussed what kind of became a lot of the foundation for Heroes of Land, Air, and Sea back when we did Tiny Epic Kingdoms, mm-hmm. and we talked about the joy of of making something like Tiny Epic Kingdoms, but on a large scale and and you know miniatures and and the whole nine yards. Um, but at that time, it just wasn't feasible. I wasn't willing to uh, take the risk t- because it just Something that big uh, can, oh, can sure. make or break your company, you know. Uh, so I, I wanted to give it time and, and wait until Gamelin Games was ready to take on such a project. And also, we, over, the, over the course of a couple of years, Scott and I continued to bounce ideas back and forth. And the idea was to try and get a board game that, that captured the spirit and the play experience of some of the older RTS-style computer games. Mm-hmm. And some of the ones that I had tried, even even ones uh, with IPs attached to them, I just didn't feel like they delivered the experience mm-hmm. or even something any, anywhere similar to the experience that I was getting when I would play it on the PC. Um, so I thought that Scott and I could do a better job. And, uh, you know, Scott locked himself in his little dungeon for a long time and came <laughs> out with uh, Heroes of Land, Air, and Sea. And then, uh, and then, you know, a few developments later, and here we are. How how fun was it to fill the the mechanics and stuff that Scott came up with with like the Ogmore lore and like characters and heroes and all sorts of things like that? Oh, that's always really exciting. And Scott um, Scott humors me quite a bit with that. He goes, <laughs> "Okay, all right, that's fine. If you want <laughs> if you want to put all your characters into this system, that's fine. He's he's a good sport about it." Um, but that's always fun, and it's it's not really much of a challenge or anything. It's just an exciting part that I get to I get to enjoy, you know. I love the fact that like Kingdoms has that whole like like crazy 
fantasy. Like, it's not just like, okay, you have a couple elves and some dwarves, but it's like there is a gambit of, like, <laughs> the amounts of different creature types and, like, race types and, like, fantasy trope types. And I really enjoy, like, there's there's fairies and minotaurs and all this stuff. And it's really cool to see a lot of that coming over in the mercenaries and stuff with Heroes of Land, Air, and Sea. And I'm like, yeah. oh, there's so much more that Heroes of Land, Air, <laughs> and Sea could have if you look at all the stuff that's in Kingdoms currently. And I know right. I know you guys <laughs> would love to someday make that stuff happen. But it's like, ah, we need – I'm like, I, I, I really wanted to make, like, a top ten list of, like – Creatures that are still in kingdoms that I'd love to see in heroes, you know? <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, we, we definitely still have a lot of room to play with with heroes. And we've been uh, developing some ideas uh, mm-hmm. for heroes of Land, Air, and Sea. That would be some new content. Um, and also uh, content that gives you a new approach to mm-hmm. the content you've already purchased. So you can kind of uh, play a little bit differently with your current box sets. So we've kind of been toying around some fun ideas that we think uh, we think fans of Heroes of Land, Air, and Sea will really enjoy. That's awesome. I I have uh, I feel like I have such a unique connection with that game because I did the preview back when you guys were first kickstarting it, and I feel bad because like we did the whole standees thing and stuff like that, and it's just like ah. But then like it looks so much better and so amazing with the miniatures and the way the game came out and like the 3D models and all that stuff. It's like it's been an interesting ride this whole time, and it's still like the go-to game that whenever I go to a Dice Tower event or a, a thing, people are like, "Roy, teach us how to play Heroes," and I mean I've played massive amounts of that game. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. I know. I, I follow you on Twitter, and I see I see your posts about it, and that's that's really great. I always feel like I'm ahead of the curve, where I'm like, I want more Heroes content, and there's probably a lot of people out there that are like, I haven't played all the stuff yet. Like, I talk to people, and like, I haven't played with the Floating Island yet, and I'm like, what are you doing with your life? You know, it's, <laughs> it's fun. Maybe I'm a little bit too passionate about the game, but I just enjoy... I enjoy the genre of, like, 4X-style games. I really enjoy the Euro-y aspect of building up and then using those resources to go out and make smart battles and tactical decisions and, like, build up your civilization. I think it's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah me too. <laughs> me too. I love our, uh, t- our our Heroes of Land, Air, and Sea reunions that we do every year at Gen Con. That's been exciting. Oh, yeah. So uh, for people that don't know, uh, I guess it started – we've done it – Three years now, Three, but at yeah. Gen Con, um, we will meet up and play a game of Heroes and Land, Air, and Sea. And I think the first time you were like showing off, the game can now be played with six players. And we're like, what? We hadn't yeah, really yeah. played with six players because I had played with just the uh, base stuff that we had done with the preview. And then it was like, oh, man, we're playing the new factions with the six players. And then we uh, the the island came out and bumped up to even more players. And I think last time we played, we played with everything possible you could possibly put in the game. Yeah, it's like as much content as possible. <laughs> that was wild. Which, which is super fun. And we play with the uh, guys from Neverboard Gaming, which are super fun. They're great sports. and uh, yeah, They're cutthroat. <laughs> they definitely are cutthroat. But At least Tom and Wes are for sure. <laughs> I don't know. I'm pretty sure Nathan's just as cutthroat as anybody else. Come on. <laughs> His main mission yeah, but, is to just fly around and kill as many things as possible. <laughs> Nathan leaves himself too exposed. He gets he gets so excited to to just wipe out all, the whole <laughs> continent of people that he leaves his capital city undefended. Listen, sometimes it's not about actually winning the game. It's about <laughs> messing up other people's day, I guess, for Nathan. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, I can I can yeah, I can contest to that. I feel like uh, when we play, it's always like head to head, like right there on the edge. It's like, ah, uh, it's always interesting because I feel like the first game it was like me, you, and Scott were like up there at the very head of the game, and like it came down to like somebody attacked you at the end. It ended up like lowering your score. Oh yeah, no, I got knocked out. I I got knocked out entirely. Yeah, and then the next game, since I won that one, everybody's like, we're not letting Roy win. And everybody just dogpiled me. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> and I think, the, and I think the, that was when the island first came out. And I'm like, I want to be birds on the island. And everybody's like, right. but I want a piece of that island, too. 
No, I you think you beat me on a tiebreaker, right? And this Well, year. this was the last game. So we've played three yeah. times. The last game The last game we kind of like talked to each other like, "Hey, well, let's be nice to each other." Until the end, like you're sitting there trying to math it out how to how to crush me. And I'm just like, "I think the alliance is over. Michael's trying to wreck me." <laughs> <laughs> well, good times. Good times. I look forward to this year to see what happens. Oh, yeah, it'll be interesting. You better have some new content to at least try by then. Come on. <laughs> Come on, right? At least a secret behind-the-scenes game, you know. I pressure to have some new content. I just love games that give you, like, those experiences and those memories and stories that you can talk about, like, long after you've played the game. Like, I think a lot of these epic-ish games can give you those moments and memories when when it's like, oh man, remember that time he did this or they did that or they backstabbed me in this thing? It's it's just very interesting the way that games can create those emotions. Yeah, if I had somebody like notating the game you know, of Heroes of Land, Air, and Sea, <laughs> they could definitely write a short story off of the, the tides of mm-hmm. how the game went. And then you could take those notations and put them in your D&D campaign and would go full cycle. Yes. <laughs> that would be awesome. <laughs> so this is when Nate got really pissed off and came up to the island to take out Roy and his bird folk. That's where the D and D campaign starts. <laughs> you're just arriving on the island. Let's go. Or, or you're just playing characters that like are having to deal with all these wars going on around them all the yeah. time. Why are there wars? You know, because people are just warmongers in this area. You know. <laughs> <laughs> well, that sounds like a fun idea. <laughs> So, um, is there a crazy fantasy race out there that you haven't added to kingdoms or or heroes that you'd like love to see implemented into those games? Uh, sure, yeah, like uh, like maybe little marsupials or something. Uh, haven't haven't gone there yet. Um, we do have kind of a bug character in uh, Tiny Epic Defenders, mm-hmm. um, but that could be further explored as well. Uh. There's a lot. I mean, there's, oh, you know, like tieflings and stuff. We haven't done that. Um, we've done the satyrs and kingdoms, but didn't mm-hmm. really bring it over to heroes. That'd be cool. I know some of the, uh, like, race types are turned into mercenaries for, for heroes. So, But it's still cool to see some of those. <laughs> their, faction, their factions are just uh, kind of hiding right now until they've built up their numbers, and then they'll come out. <laughs> oh, snap. There's spoilers right there. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, so everybody needs to keep keep backing all of the tiny epic games so that Roy can have more kingdoms eventually, and Michael can continue to make king or or heroes eventually, so Michael can continue to make heroes. Now we've done like uh, demons, kind of like Balrog kind of things, but we've mm-hmm. not done any angels. We don't really have ah. any. I mean, we have like the Valkyries, but that's, they're not quite like a angel kind of faction. So it's, you know, I mean, yeah, there's still yeah. quite a bit. You have all kinds of stuff in Kingdoms too. There's like yetis and and bears and yeah. pig folk. I mean, there's like everything in there. Yeah. <laughs> and I'd still love to, to see. You're gonna have to get excited about Tiny Epic Defenders because that's that's the continuation of the story from Kingdoms. Mm. And there's a lot of there's even more new kind of nuance uh, uh, fantasy tropes in Defenders mm. that aren't in Kingdoms or in Heroes of Land, Air, and Sea. So. Really, Heroes of Land, Air, and Sea needs to just pick from Kingdoms and Defenders until we visited all of them. Oh, man. I need to go back and um, explore all the stuff in Defenders, too. I really like the items in Defenders as well. That's one of the things I thought is really cool is how you guys have utilized the item meeples in these games. Yeah, we got... Uh, we, yeah, Tiny Epic Mechs was a ton of fun. I mean, just the, the whole idea of putting your, your item meeple into a plastic mech suit, that was... That was really exciting. That was a lot of fun to to make and to see it come together and to see the final product. Uh, and I kind of want to play around with the item meeples in that way a little bit more in one of our upcoming Tiny Epic games where we add, you know, additional layers of accessories beyond just, like, weapons. Oh, that's crazy. I, I think just the whole idea is so interesting. I remember when I first started, like, I had played the prototype of quest but then when i actually got a copy of quest and then uh i i sat down and i was going to teach mark street and emerson how to play the game and emerson's like man these item meeples turned out really great and i'm like yeah they're <laughs> awesome and he's like you know like i did the sculpting for the little things and i'm like what 
Emerson, yeah. come on. And I was like, how did I not know this was a thing? Um, but it's really cool, like, how all that stuff has come together and how um, – it's crazy how like these little meeples you can make things so thematic just by giving them all sorts of different accessories. Yeah, yeah, and Emerson's done a great job making them look so nice too. And he's done all of the tiny, he's done all of the item meeples mm -hmm. uh, designs and stuff. So yeah, he's fantastic, very talented individual. <laughs> it's crazy going from <laughs> designing games to also sculpting little little plastic swords and and chainsaws and all sorts of crazy stuff. And just being an excellent human as well. That <laughs> takes talent these days. That's, you know, he's, there he's is that. There is that. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, I'm definitely interested to see what what crazy things you guys can, can come up with next to uh, stick on some little Meeple guys. Yeah, well, we'll just have to wait and see. Gotcha. Um, so, so how far out do you think there will be till an announcement of anything new, or when should people be looking for something on the horizon? Uh, well, I would say within the next uh, two months, mm -hmm. we'll be announcing something new for the Tiny Epic line. Um, and then we've also been exploring some games outside the Tiny Epic line that we're working on for this year that are also very exciting. Uh, one of them's a revival of an old Reiner Kinesia title uh, that has been out of print since I mean, 15, 17 years or something like that, that we're going to be bringing back this year. And we're super excited about that. So That's crazy. So this is going to be something that's not necessarily in a small package like normal games that you guys do? It's going to be something completely different? Yeah, it'll be kind of medium-sized package, but it's still oh, nice. a, uh, it's still a, um, an inexpensive price point, uh, mm. but it's in a bit larger of a box, yeah. How important is making your games like affordable to the consumer? Because it seems like it seems like a, a a big concern for like all of these awesome tiny epic games. Um, the fact that like they're so affordable for people out there that want to play them. I well, I think that it it helps um, just with especially being kind of the flavor of the new uh, mentality that's in the hobby industry right now mm -hmm. in the buying trends. Um, I think that it's not uncommon to have buyer's remorse when you mm. pick up a really expensive game and you play it once and you want to play it, even if you really like it. But every time you go to a game group, a game night or something, somebody else has brought a new game that they just got from Kickstarter and yours gets pushed to the end of the end of the line, even though it's also new, but it's not new. It's not new this week. Right. Um, <laughs> And then, and then eventually you kind of just sit and stare at it on the shelf and, and wonder why you dumped so dang much money on it. And uh, that doesn't really happen at the price point that Tiny Epic is. And I, I think that that's something that's that's a relief for the series. Mm -hmm. um, and also it's good for people who are just kind of wanting to get their feet wet in board gaming and they're not really fully committed yet. They don't know that they really like it all that much yet. But, you know, 20, 25 bucks is... You know, something that they can uh, justify to trying something out. And, and hopefully they like it and they see that there's a lot of other games to explore now that you've started somewhere. And so that's also, I think, a, a nice thing that the series does. Yeah, I think it's definitely interesting because, like, when you're looking at games and reviewing games, it's hard to, to talk about price point a whole lot because price point means so much. It means a very different thing depending on where people are, you know. Some people, it's like... Oh yeah, this giant Kickstarter, no big deal. But for a lot of people, me included, it's like, oh my goodness, I can't afford to buy crazy Kickstarters out there. And and when you see something that's like, oh man, there's a lot that comes in this game, especially for that, yeah, I'll totally like jump on that and try that out. And it's definitely interesting um, when you're looking at any of the tiny epic games. It's like, man, you you get a lot for you, there's a lot of bang for your buck inside those boxes, you know. Yeah, and like I said earlier, that's that's what mattered to me when I first got into buying board games was mm -hmm. the bang for the buck and the components that you get. And so I guess I, I constantly feel like my target audience is me, and mm -hmm. I just hope that there's a bunch of other people out there and, and, and <laughs> you know, the series has done well. Uh, but yeah, I just kind of so long as I so long as the the me five years ago would buy the game, you know, and you know how yeah you know, that was that's the kind of games I like to make. That's awesome. I do like that uh, a lot of your genres of games are like the typical, like we're going to do a tiny epic of this thing that 
everybody i mean there's lots of games out there like oh space everybody likes space fantasy everybody likes fantasy zombies now we're doing a zombie game it's not going to be the same as these other zombie games but it's going to be our take on it it's cool that you guys have basically hit a ton of like the popular themes and you guys are doing dinosaurs and it's 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 crazy to see all of these different games and genres so you can be like tiny epic game we got that you know yeah, well, it's yeah, well, and it's a lot of fun working in in those spaces, even though they are kind of, you know, in some people's opinions, overdone or you know, uh, it's it's fun because the play experience is neat because a lot of people they can they can create the story of, of how they're playing and, and based on kind of what they like about that genre already. It's like if you mm-hmm. if you're into uh, you know if Star Wars or Star Trek or whatever, and you're playing Tiny Epic Galaxies. It doesn't really have any direct connection to Star Wars or Star Trek, but you can you can still put yourself there in your imagination because the theme is similar enough and mm-hmm. and kind of see it happening in in that space. And that's you know that's I think fun for people to do. And so, or if I you like just to want to be that. generic <laughs> SpaceX traveling and colonizing planets, you know, however you want to yeah. pull it off. Right, right. That's awesome, man. Um, Man, it I I don't want to ask too much about like future stuff, but is there is there a theme that you guys have like shot for but haven't quite been able to make it or or don't know if you'll ever be able to make that theme work? Uh yeah, so there's been a couple actually. Um one that we had uh in development for a little while that got put on a shelf. Um but I think that we're all committed to getting back around to exploring it and, and making it work one day uh, is Tiny Epic Trains mm. and and doing uh, something in that space. Scott Alms uh, was an engineer for um, railroad parts and, and whatnot for his day job for many, many years. And so oh, like an actual engineer. Right. Actually, yes. Like a true <laughs> engineer, an actual one. <laughs> Yeah, and so that's uh, that's a theme that's always kind of been close to his heart, mm-hmm. and something that that we've tried to explore in the past that hasn't quite come to fruition yet. So that's one. <laughs> nice. I just you should just make like a little tiny little Thomas the Tank Engine train set that's inside the box. You can like push the trains around. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> with item right. holes on top of it, with with bows and arrows, and swords. That'd be fun. <laughs> we do want to do we do want to do a crossover at some point where we have kind of this mashup of of components and and rules and stuff from you know a select uh, number of the tiny epic games that exist in a new tiny epic game. That that would be a lot of fun. Nice. Um. So you guys do a whole bunch of the conventions and you go to like the convention circuit and all that stuff. How important do you think that is as like a publisher? I think it's really important. Uh, in the beginning, it was it was paramount, um, mm-hmm. being able to connect with with the fans and get your name out there and and be in that space. That was just absolutely critical. Uh, it allowed you to put your game in front of a lot of people and and mm-hmm. have them play it and not just get excited or or join the hype train from online, but actually play the game and experience it themselves. Um, and that that converts them in a, in a way that you know is much more effective. Um, and it's, it's still very important to continue to be out there. You know, the industry is growing tremendously. And so every year these conventions are growing tremendously. So there's Mm -hmm. always, you know, thousands of new people. Um, so it continues to stay very important. And yeah, we go to six or eight shows a year. Um, but with a couple of kids at home, you know, now it's been a little bit Mm -hmm. harder for me to go to all the shows and it's made it a little bit challenging trying to, uh, expand how many shows we go to every year, but we 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 always hit the big ones, and and that's yeah. I think it's incredibly important as a for a publisher to stay uh, in the in the public with their fans and and be able to meet their fans, have people come up and say how awesome your games are and how much they love them, or have somebody mm-hmm. come up and, uh, and show you how angry they are that the wood arm was broken off of their warrior meeple when they arrived in the box and yeah, <laughs> that's good too you know <laughs> but it's uh, we've had we've had you know a few of those but that's good opportunities to 
to turn a negative into a positive. And mm-hmm. sometimes that's what you get to do by being out there in public at the show. That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, for me, I mean, we do board game media here at the Dice Tower and just having our own booth and doing all that stuff and connecting with, like, the fans and the people all around is, like, the main reason we do it. I mean, it's not – I don't know how many people we sell on the Dice Tower that aren't already fans of the Dice Tower, but it's awesome to see people that already are fans of the content to come up and be like, have have a place to – to see you and be present and i'm sure it's the same way with publishers it's like we're out here we're making this game we're doing this thing you know um you guys have been doing kickstarter for like a really long time do you think the kickstarter like marketplace has changed over the years it's like back in the day kickstarter was like this fresh new thing but now it's like so many companies from big to small companies are on kickstarter yeah uh i mean it's changed um, drastically. So there are mm-hmm. some things that are still very much the same about Kickstarter, um, like the stretch goals and and whatnot. But um, but it has definitely changed. Uh, you know, back mm-hmm. when I did my first Kickstarter in 2011, I think the highest funded game at that time was Alien Frontiers at mm-hmm. like 30 some thousand. Uh, and that's the and, best board And game now, ever if somebody made 30 some thousand on Kickstarter, people would be like utter failure. You know. <laughs> Uh, so, but it has definitely changed a lot. Um, the marketplace is much bigger, but mm-hmm. the buyers have become more discerning and they, you know, I think that in some ways it's more challenging for beginners to get mm-hmm. noticed now. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, just gigantic projects that, that are out there that they have, you know, funding and money from previous projects that they can put into their marketing materials to, spruce up their page and make it look nicer and you know some of these things that the newer kickstarter creators don't have access to the kind of resources for that and back in the day when it was kind of first started that was okay because it was kind Mm -hmm. of a level playing field that's changed for sure um and you know i think that also certain expectations of creators from the backers have in some ways gotten looser but in other ways have definitely gotten tighter so Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, it's definitely interesting because it's like before Kickstarter used to be like the place to like, oh, we're going to kickstart this thing. Now it's like, no, 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 this is just how we make board games. And there's so many amazing games from the industry come through Kickstarter. But I feel like as some – if someone ever wanted to like start up a publishing company or want to start up and make their dream game come true, it would be hard to pull off without having – like it's it's definitely not nearly as easy as it was and even as like if someone wants to design a game they would even pitch their game to publishers so that that now a publisher would take it and kickstart it themselves you know it's like you want the big name to to be able to show off the game cuz yeah. publishers have a big following on kickstarter you know yeah yeah absolutely um yeah, it's interesting that way, and it, you know, I think starting new right now would be quite tricky. But it's happening. There are projects that come out, uh, you know, not infrequently, that mm-hmm. where it's their first project and they strike gold with their mm-hmm. with a certain fan base, and and boom, it blows up. But it is harder and harder to do that these days. You know, one of the things that's interesting that's changed about like the expectations for stretch goals in Kickstarter is that earlier in earlier years. Um, it was, you know, and this is something that, that we really embraced with our tiny epic games, uh, especially Kingdoms and, and Defenders, and uh, was taking community suggestions and running polls and doing that for adding new factions and, mm-hmm. and changing the game in pretty meaningful ways um, based off of the feedback of the, the Kickstarter community um, and, and that kind of being a regular thing. And while, and I've said this before, but every Tiny Epic game has been made better through suggestions from the Kickstarter community. And that's still true even to up to our most recent Tiny Epic with Tiny Epic Dinosaurs. Mm-hmm. Um, but in the older days, it, that, that was more significant. It was mm-hmm. more present, right? And that was kind of what people wanted and, and what people expected. And, and now it's like, it's kind of swapped where people want a little bit more preparation. They want the game to be a little bit more complete because they want to trust that when you give them an estimated delivery date, 
that you that you mean what you're going to say. I think there's been too many campaigns that have burned the fans by adding things on and then ultimately um, not delivering on time or not delivering at all because they they got too excited and just absorbed too much ideas of stretch goals and and kind of just went wild with it. Um, so now there's definitely an expectation for a finer balance between that and uh, yeah we don't get quite as many suggestions as we used to and we get people that come up and, and say you know you know I want my publishers to have had all of this thought out before going to Kickstarter because I want you know it to have had ample development time I want for the factory to have said that yes they can actually make what you're promising us on Kickstarter and they they right. want that comfort now and so it's it's evolved that way it's it's kind of interesting because like back in the day it was like when you're kickstarting it's like you're becoming like a backer of this project you're part of this project you're we're gonna get like input and feedback and we're gonna show you like what we're working on behind the scenes and all that stuff and now these days it feels like people feel like that's almost like sloppy almost it's like no 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 you need to have the game ready and done and show us like the perfect representation of the game and then deliver exactly yeah. that you know it's like you have to yeah. have every single thing done up front you have to have this flawless campaign with amazing unlocks of miniature after miniature you know that sort of thing <laughs> and it's that's just hard. like oh my goodness that's so hard to do too it, t- it takes a lot of planning and mm-hmm. you know what kind of what way do you go about it right and yeah, it's it's interesting. It's it's, it's almost like you need you need a Kickstarter to fund your ability to make a Kickstarter. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> that would not work. <laughs> Kickstarter for this. Listen, yeah. I need I need to do uh, graphic design and all this design work for my Kickstarter. So hey, if you guys could, <laughs> you could do a GoFundMe for your kit. No, never mind. Never mind. This is a terrible idea. <laughs> I know you guys do uh, trips like once a year to China and to see all the manufacturing and how your games are done and try to like figure yep. out the best way to um, like who to work with and the best way to get great deals on putting the game together. Can you tell us a little bit about that process? Yeah, so we we go once a, we've been going once a year now for the past few years. Um, uh, at last year went twice, mm-hmm. uh, and in the beginning it was a matter of, of trying to find different factories that we could we could meet the team that was going to be behind making the game um and kind of jive with them and then also shop around for the best price because you really do get different prices if you're standing there in person with a quote request than if you're emailing it from the united states you you get a little bit of a different price um and and also Lately, you know, a lot of the reason why we're going back still is it really cuts down on the amount of time when you're going through like the color proofing and the mm-hmm. physical uh, proofing process for the game. Um, you know, if they send us something and it takes a week to get to me, and I, I check it out, I reply a couple of days later. They like, okay, we'll make those adjustments. And then they send it, and it t- takes another week, a week and a half to get to me. And if we have to go back and forth like that for three or four changes, that's five weeks. You know, mm-hmm. whereas if I'm if I'm at the factory for three days, when you're there in person, they they really uh, they treat you well, and they they get, get working on your projects while you're there because it's that important. It's, you know, and so in the, you know we'll meet in the morning. And they'll show me something and I'll be like, no, you know, we need to change this a little bit. Mm -hmm. And they may have it changed already that afternoon or the next morning versus a week and a half. And if we so we go through three or four changes that way, we could do six weeks worth of work in three days. And so it's really uh, tremendously worth it going out there and seeing it in person and making sure you get it exactly right without wasting a ton of time, which can be frustrating and, of course, can result in delays on your project. And so. Uh, by going out there, and now we've kind of been we we time it to where when we have a few projects that are kind of concluding at the same time, we'll go out there and go through that uh, final process as well, not just the proofing process. And so now we've kind of increased how many times we go out there, but it's worth it. So as a publisher, you think working super closely with manufacturing definitely helps make the end product for the consumer a lot better. Yeah, well, and I think that that's most important. I think, you know, as a publisher, that's your whole name and your reputation and your brand. It's all tied to that final product that your customers uh, get to have and and enjoy or not enjoy. Mm -hmm. And 
And so that's the most important part is how that is the kind of the integrity, if you will, of that product. And so by going out to China, we I can be much more uh, meticulous and, and, you know, really focus in and make sure that it's done right. That's awesome. And I'm sure it's, it's cool to like see exactly how the product that you're sending is actually like being put together and manufactured. It's like, Oh look, they're making item meeples and they're doing this and that. And, and sometimes you'd be like, Oh, yeah. oh this is not the, the latest update. Did you get the newest update on that card? We re replaced the, the text on that one, you know, that sort of thing. I've been there. Yep. <laughs> been there where I'm like looking at a, I'm looking at the card at the factory and I'm like, Oh, uh, wait a minute. And I get on my phone. I'm like, messaging Ben Shulman back in the United States, this needs to be changed immediately. Can you give me this file tomorrow so that they can print off a new one for tomorrow? And yeah, it's, it's, it's priceless really. I'm sure the graphic designer loves, loves when they get those phone calls. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's neat seeing, it's neat when you just see piles, you just stacks and stacks of your games and, or you, or you watch them coming through, you know, and you, cause the box of the, the labels and then they got this big machine where they punch kind of the box down onto the label, it sticks it around it, and then the other arms kind of lift it up, and this is really cool. Yeah, that's one of the things that I'd love to see more board game content on is, like, the actual manufacturing of games. I I think it'd be so cool to see a lot of that behind the scenes of, like, from from beginning to end of, like, this is how the game was was put together and made. It's super interesting. Well, if we had, like, a, you know, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, he could... Take us on a little factory tour of a board game. <laughs> <laughs> we need more of that. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Awesome, man. Well, I think we're right here at an hour for this interview. Um, so if there's anything that – if anybody would like to learn more about Gambling Games or know where to find some of your stuff or be able to see like more of the games you guys put out, where can they find that? Uh, so they can check us out on our website at GamblingGames.com. Um or they can Google Tiny Epic hmm. and it'll pop up or Google Gamelin' Games. Uh, check us out on Instagram at Gamelin' Games, Twitter at Gamelin' underscore games, and of course Facebook at Gamelin' Games. Awesome. Well, I look forward to our uh, future Gen Con showdowns, Michael, and it's definitely been oh, a yeah. blast having you on the show. <laughs> well, thanks a lot, Roy, for having me, and take care. Awesome. Thanks so much. Bye. Right. Bye-bye. Thanks so much for watching another Dice Tower video. If you enjoy our videos, subscribe to the channel for more fun, comprehensive board game coverage. Also, consider joining us at one of our events. Come to Dice Tower Retreat, a small, intimate gathering where gaming is king. Join us for Dice Tower Cruise, the largest board game cruise. Attend Dice Tower West in Las Vegas for gaming fun on the West Coast or Dice Tower East in Orlando in sunny Florida. Dice Tower Conventions, the friendliest gaming conventions on Earth. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching The Dice Tower.